Hello and welcome to part four of chapter four in cultivation of prokaryotic organisms. In this particular lecture, uh, we are going to talk about the four primary classes of media, the different types of media that are used in the laboratory, and how those media are used in diagnostics, environmental uh, microbiology, and identification of microorganisms. In the cultivation of prokaryotic organisms, we really have to have a lot of different things that we need to think about. So that means that we have to take into consideration different classes of media. Um, in these different classes of media, we have two basic types here, the complex and defined. Complex is sometimes also referred to as undefined. And this is a media that has lots of different nutrients in it. It'll have some proteins, some carbohydrates, some lipids. Some of the proteins may be pre-digested. Some of them may be in their complete state. Regardless of... Um, of which ones are in there. We know there's proteins in there, but we don't know exactly which ones or which amino acids are there. Or we know there's sugar in it, but we don't know exactly how much of each sugar. So it's an undefined type of media. Think um, extract, right? When we have a couple, we have like a yeast extract broth. We're extracting nutrients from other things to put in this broth, but we can't really say for sure exactly everything that's in there. These work very, very well for fastidious organisms because there's usually a very wide array, a large, uh, a, a large diversity of organism of um, nutrition in that that uh, that media. The other is a defined media, and defined media are very, very uh, uh, you follow a specific recipe. So not only do we know exactly what's in that media, but we know exactly how much. Very precise measurements, very precise concentrations, and they are usually very simple medias. They do not have a lot of different ingredients. Um, Non-fastidious organisms will also grow in complex media, but non-fastidious organisms have the ability um, for us to be very distinct about their requirements, and they oftentimes grow best in a more defined environment. Now, there are specific types of media uh, in the laboratory. You might think about this in terms of diagnostic tests, right? Um, in this picture here, we're just looking at a whole bunch of different types of agroplates that by changing the supplements and nutrients and um, ingredients in the agar that is used to fill these plates, we can determine different characteristics. Now, it is not likely the case, but just imagine this is the same microorganism in all of these plates, the exact same microorganism being grown in six different types of media, and it's giving us six different color results. And that's because the variable here that's being changed is the supplements that are in the agar, not the organism itself. So we can learn lots of different characteristics about bacteria by um, by growing it in multiple types of media. And this is also used a lot in diagnostics and identification of bacteria. So we usually use different types of media to determine a very specific characteristic or metabolic property of an organism. The four basic classes of media are enriched, selective, differential, and reducing. Uh, selective and differential, as well as enriched, these three here, uh, the, the first three, are oftentimes interchangeable or will have more than one property in a single media, whereas in a reducing media, that one's pretty specific. So let's take a look at these four media. The first is the enriched. In the enriched media, we are going to add some type of supplement or compound or chemical or nutrient that might be very specific to promote the growth of an organism that may otherwise be difficult to grow. For example, this is a blood agar plate. So organisms that utilize and grow very well in the presence of red blood cells, we may grow them on a uh, blood agar plate. So this is an agar that's been supplemented with uh, red blood cells, packed red blood cells. And these organisms grow very well on it. Now, it just so happens that blood agar plates can also be differential, um, and we'll talk about those in a second. But for the sake of this slide, I just want you to understand that um, an enriched media is one that we're gonna add something specific to that plate in order to promote the growth of an organism that may otherwise be difficult to grow. So if we enrich the media with its basically its favorite ice cream, it's gonna grow a lot better. So we're trying to give it its, its favorite flavor. In a selective media, we are going to allow the growth of one type of organism, but inhibit the growth of another. And the example here is the mannitol salt agar. 
This is another test that's also, it's both selective and differential, but let's just talk about its selective property for right now. So in its selectivity in a mannitol salt agar, this agar has a high salt concentration added to it. And this high salt concentration inhibits the growth or prevents the growth of microorganisms that are not able to grow in high salt. And the reason for this is we want to, we are looking for a very specific type of organism. In the case of this agar, we are looking for Staph aureus. Staph aureus is normal skin flora. So any organism that's normal skin flora is probably going to have the ability to grow in a high salt concentration. So by growing in that high salt concentration, if I add a high salt concentration to my agar, I'll prevent the growth of any, organ any other organisms that may get in that plate that I'm not looking for because I'm looking for Staph aureus. I know that that's a high salt uh, growth bacteria, what we call a halophile or salt loving uh, bacteria. So I just eliminate all of the organisms that are non-halophile to help rule out all of those organisms because I know that's not what I'm looking for. So in selectivity, we want to add, we're going to add some type of ingredient, ingredient known as the selective agent. And that selective agent is the component of that media that inhibits the growth of one type of organism but allows the growth of another. So that's selectivity. A differential media is one that contains additional ingredients that allow us to differentiate one organism from another. So we may have multiple bacteria growing, multiple prokaryotes growing on the same plate, but I am looking for some type of metabolic difference between them. So in this case right here, this plate right here is called an EMB, uh, ESNY methylene blue agar. And this, um, this particular test here is able to differentiate between fecal coliforms, environmental coliforms, and non-coliforms. And the reason we do this, this is an environmental test. So uh, environmental coliforms are expected to be found in this test. If you tested lake water from, uh, you know, or canal water from any of the canals here in Florida, you would totally expect to find a little bit of salmonella in that water because salmonella is normal flora, normal fauna for um, turtles, reptiles, birds, fish, all of that. So those organisms, it's part of their normal flora. If we find E. coli in those waters, then that tells us that raw sewage has contaminated those waters because E. coli is normal flora for warm-blooded mammals. Now there may be some low levels of it from say deer or something like that, but for the most part, um, uh, if we see high levels of E. coli, then what we're looking at is raw sewage contamination. So that's an environmental test. Now, the, the problem is that if I use just a diagnostic test for this, if I use the same concept and used a diagnostic test, I would look for coliforms. I'm not in a diagnostic test. I'm not looking to differentiate between an environmental coliform and a fecal coliform. I'm just looking for the presence of a coliform. So if I used the wrong media to test that lake water, I could possibly close down a lake or cause um, a lot of monetary loss in remediation for a, a lake that does not necessarily need to be remediated. So um, that differential ability of this test is really important. On the left is a citrate media. This is probably a less complex explanation. In this particular media, we differentiate bacteria based on their ability to break down citrate. So some organisms can go straight into the citric acid cycle with citrate. Other organisms cannot. They don't have that ability. So if they can, they'll grow and turn blue. So this would be positive. And if they can't, they will not grow and the tube will remain green. The last is the reducing media. And reducing media is used for the growth and differentiation of anaerobic uh, microorganisms. We're looking to grow anaerobes. Um, it includes ingredients, chemical ingredients that will reduce or eliminate dissolved oxygen in the media itself. It's a um, compound called thioglycolate. So thioglycolate absorbs oxygen uh, and prevents it from being available to microorganisms. Uh, we can grow, th we can use thioglycolate media, reducing media in both a broth form and an agar form. And again, sodium thioglycolate is the actual uh, uh, ingredient in this media that absorbs that oxygen. So if I want to grow an anaerobic organism or an aerotolerant organism or even a microaerophile, 
I probably am going to want to put it in some type of thioglycolate media in order to promote its growth because I, I want to reduce those oxygen levels for those types of organisms. I would not want to try and grow um, an aerobic organism in a uh, reducing media. Am I trying to grow, like I said, in the thioglycolate, am I trying to grow a microaerophile? Am I trying to grow an aerotolerant? Where is this uh, patient sample coming from? Uh, so we have something called anaerobic chambers, and the concept of an anaerobic chamber is based off um, an old-fashioned way of producing uh, anaerobic environments known as a candle jar. Now, in a candle jar, I'm just going to draw one over here. We have a, it's not drawing, we have a large jar like this. Inside the jar, we would place our plates of agar with bacteria on it. And then on the top of the stack of plates or where the broth tubes are, we would add a candle. And so this candle would be lit, and we would then seal the jar with a lid. And the candle will continue to burn. Um, it uses oxygen for burning. So the candle would continue to burn until all of the oxygen in the jar has been depleted, and the candle will go out on its own. Once the candle has gone out, it's assumed that the oxygen inside the jar has been depleted, and those organisms that are microaerophilic, aerotolerant, or anaerobic will be able to grow inside that candle jar as long as it stays sealed. Now, modern days, we don't use a candle jar anymore, but we do use these anaerobic chambers, which we see in these boxes here. Uh, you can see here, here's a plastic one. It's a pouch, just a plastic pouch. And what they do is in these containers and bags, they put the, the plates of bacteria they're trying to grow, and then they take thioglycolate, sodium thioglycolate, uh, that um, it's usually a gauze pad of some kind or filter paper, and it's been soaked in sodium thioglycolate. That's what's in these foil packets here. And it's placed in a little clip inside of these chambers. The chambers are sealed. Now that sodium thioglycolate is going to absorb and attract all of the oxygen. That oxygen gets trapped on the, um, on the sodium thioglycolate pad, and then it's no longer available or accessible by the organisms, so the organisms are now capable of growing in an anaerobic environment. So that ends part four of chapter four. We are going to have one more section, part five, in which we are going to talk about ways that we can detect and measure growth of organisms in the laboratory. See you in the next one.